Okay, so first let me introduce myself briefly. My name is uh, uh, Chang Ye. I'm from the School of Mechanical Science and Engineering at Huazhong University of Science and Technology in Wuhan, China. So the topic of my presentation today is improving pinning efficacy through high amplitude short duration pulsed current. Fatigue failure is responsible for more than 90% of all metallic failures. And component fatigue knife is composed of the crack initiation knife and crack propagation knife. And during crack initiation and propagation, tensor stress will accelerate this process and compressive stress will slow down this process. So if we can embed a layer of compressive resistive stresses in the near surface region of the material, then we can significantly improve the Fatigue performance. Traditionally, we use uh, short pinning to generate compressive residual stresses. In a short pinning process, metallic balls bombard against the, uh, the um, component surface and creates indents and uh, generate beneficial compressive residual stresses in the uh, subsurface. In addition to short pinning, um, we also have electronic pinning and laser shock pinning that can induce compressive resistive stresses through very similar uh, mechanisms. <clears throat> However, pinning is not effective for all metals. The effectiveness of pinning treatment actually depends on the plasticity of the target samples. For metals with poor plasticity, it is like striking a brittle glass using a hammer. So if the force is too low, nothing will happen. However, if we strike it really hard, the glass will fracture. So for metals with poor plasticity, we need to improve its plasticity before effective pinning treatment. There are many ways to improve the uh, metal plasticity. For example, in warm laser pinning, we can use a hard plate to hit the temperature of the sample to in improve its uh, plasticity. In aerosolic hard rolling, we can also use uh, uh, furnace heating. Induction heating and laser heating uh, have also been used. However, none of this is the focus of our talk today. Today, we're gonna talk about pulse current assisted aerosolic pinning of Ti-64. During this process, the target sample Ti-64 alloy is subjected to simultaneous aerosolic pinning and electropulsing. It is expected that by the synergistic effect of aerosolic pinning and electropulsing, we can see interesting microstructure changes in Ti-64, and hopefully that needs to uh, improve the mechanical properties. So in this study, the aerosolic pinning was carried out using a aerosolic nanocrystal surface modification system. So it is essentially a, a aerosolic pinning system integrated in a small CNC lathe. So in traditional uh, aerosolic pinning, we use a handheld system, and the because of the nature of the of this system, it lacks uh, repeatability and reliability. It really depends on the uh, on the on the worker who is you know doing the electronic pinning treatment. So in our system, in the USM system, the process parameters, including static and dynamic load, the striking amplitude, the scanning speed, and uh, the uh, uh, the um, distance between neighbor scans can be precisely controlled we can uh, use this system to effectively process broad samples as well as square samples. So this is a pulse current power supply that we use in this study. It can provide a peak current of 2000A. We have a pulse width of 100 microsecond and the frequency can be adjusted between 100 to 800 hertz. <clears throat> So in this table here, we have uh, three sets of uh, pulse current with the peak current density ranging from 44 to 70. 
And then we actually adjust the frequency to make sure they have the same root mean square current density of 6.38. And then we also use a set of continuous current with the same root mean square current density uh, uh, for comparison purpose. <clears throat> the table in the bottom shows the USM process parameters. We have a frequency of 20,000 hertz, static load of 50 newton, electronic pinning uh, amplitude of 24 microns, scanning speed of 250 millimeter per minute, and uh, the distance between label scans is uh, 10 micrometers. So first we uh, use an infrared camera to monitor sample temperature during processing. Uh, as we can see, that uh, for all four sets of experiments, the uh, peak, peak temperature is between 276 and 280. That means they have very close uh, peak temperature. So we also plot the um, uh, temperature as a function of time. And we, uh, we have four sets of, uh, ex uh, four sets of uh, uh, current parameters, and for each set, we have, we repeat the measurement by three times. So we have a total of twelve measurements. We can see that all these twelve measurements, they pretty much overlap. That means they have uh, uh, the same, you no, know, or very similar uh, temperature profile. So now let's take a look at the uh, microstructure. So first, we use SEN to um, characterize the cross-sectional microstructure uh, of the different the process conditions. So Fig A shows the typical alpha phase and beta phase microstructure of Type 64, and in Figure B, we uh, can see that when no current was used, traditional atmospheric pinning resulted in a plastic deformation layer with a thickness of 19.4 microns, and when continuous current was used, uh, it actually increased the depth of plastic dimension to around 26 microns. The three figures in the bottom actually shows the um, uh, for the uh, pulse current. We can see that uh, with the increase of the peak current density, actually the plastic deformation layer thickness increases, especially when we have a peak current density of 78 per millimeter square. The um, that depth of uh, plastic deformation layer was increased to more than 63 microns. This is a significant improvement compared with, um, you know, traditional electronic pinning and a continuous current assisted uh, electronic pinning. So we also used the misorientation from EBSD to characterize the uh, layer of plastic deformation. And we can see that uh, in these three figures, the red color represents higher misorientation with an angle of uh, five degree. And then the uh, yellow and green is median misorientation. And the blue color actually represents uh, zero misorientation. So we can see that when no kernel was used, traditional electronic pinning actually resulted in a plastic deformation layer uh, to this region, and then when we use continuous current, the depth was actually slightly increased. However, when we uh, use a pulse current, especially this pulse current number three, we can see a dramatic increase of the depth of plastic deformation. So then we also use statistical tool to analyze the uh, misorientation. The, we have the average KM value. So KM represents kernel average misorientation. And from these three figures, we can see that when no kernel was used, the average KM value is 1.22. When continuous current was used, it was increased to 1.32. However, when pulse current number three was used, the average KM value was significantly increased to 2.21. We know that uh, pulse current, this means that pulse current leads to greater plastic strain, even though the electronic pinning conditions and the temperatures are the same. So gray refinement is another important uh, 
um, measure for atmospheric pinning, and we use EBSD to characterize the uh, 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 grains. And we can see from figure A that when no current was used, the um, depth of grain refinement is around 23.5 microns. When continuous current was used, it was actually increased to around 32 microns. However, when pulse current was used, the layer, the depth of grain refinement was increased to more than 60 microns. So we measure the surface and the in-depth hardness of the sample after different process conditions. As we can see, that that uh, traditional electronic pinning without current has increased the surface hardness so from 314 to 418. Right? When continuous current was used, it was increased to 430. And then here we see three sets of pulse current. Actually, the surface hardening is increases increases gradually with the increase of the peak current density. When we we have uh, the highest peak current density, we have the highest hardness of 470. So then we uh, uh, we uh, also have the in-depth hardness. We can see that uh, pulse current uh, system electronic pinning actually leads to the highest surface and in-depth hardness. So the compressive residual stresses is another important measure for electronic pinning. So let's take a look at the figure on the left-hand side. First, we can see that for traditional electronic pinning, the uh, magnitude of the compressive residual stress is around 500 megapascal, and the depth is around 180 uh, micrometers. When continuous current was used, uh, the um, we can see from the green curve that uh, the magnitude was slightly increased. The depth of the compression layer was slightly improved uh, too. However, when we have a, when we use pulse current, we have the blue and then this uh, magenta and then this pink curve. Especially the pink curve corresponds to EP3. We see a significant improvement in the magnitude and depths of the compressive residual stresses. Specifically, the magnitude was of the resistance stress was increased to uh, around 800 megapascal, and depth was increased to nearly 400 micrometers. So this is a significant improvement compared with traditional electronic pinning. And we have observed a very similar phenomenon in a transverse uh, direction. So then, <clears throat> we can uh, observe that compared with traditional electronic pinning, pulse current assisted electronic pinning leads to higher hardness, deeper plastic affected depths, and a higher magnitude of compressive resistances. All these are beneficial for component fatigue performance. Um, it is thus expected that uh, pulse current assisted electronic pinning will further increase the fatigue strength of tire 64 alloy. So we're still working on the uh, the uh, fatigue test. However, in our previous study, we have observed that significant improvement in fatigue performance uh, in aluminum alloy and stainless steel after the sonic pinning. So then uh, we need to ask uh, ourselves these questions since the, we have the same temperature, that means we have the same thermal heating effect. But why is pulse current better than continuous current in terms of grain refinement, plastic effect depths, and the magnitude and depths of compressive residual stresses? We know that uh, the um, effectiveness of pinning treatment actually depends on the um, plasticity of the target sample. So to answer this question, we need to study how the pulse current affects the plasticity of tire 64. So next, we want to study plasticity of, in, of tire 64 subject to pulse current. So we carried out the uh, pulse current assisted tensile test, and we um, apply a current to the sample during the tensile test. Then we use an os uh, oscilloscope to monitor the current 
And then we also use the infrared camera to monitor the sample temperature. Right. So we have five sets of uh, uh, pulse current with uh, peak density ranging from 65 to 165. A per millimeter square, and then we again we adjust the frequency to make sure they have the same exact uh, uh, RMS current density of 12.1. And then it, uh, we use two sets of um, um, continuous current uh, for comparison purpose. So first we 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 let's take a look at the temperature of the sample during the tensile test. So we can see that for all five sets of pulse current, they have very similar temperature profile. However, for continuous current, when the, peak, when the current density is 12.1, the uh, temperature is much lower. So then that's why we actually increase the um, current density to 13. And now they have the uh, same uh, temperature profile. So that means the same thermal heating effect for fair comparison. So the figure on the right hand side actually shows the um, engineering stress and strain curve. We can see that uh, the red curve represents continuous current with a current density of 13, uh, of 13. And then we can see that for the pulse current, actually the flow stress uh, increases gradually, I mean decreases gradually with the increase of the peak current density. When the peak current density is the highest, is 165, we have the lowest flow stress. Okay, so this is much lower than that for continuous current. Right, so then we know we have uh, clearly observed the electroplasticity effect. Okay, so we know that the thermal effect. So with the temperature increase, the material flow stress will of course decrease. However, during the tensile test, we have kept sample temperature constant. Okay. They have same temperature and the same thermal heating effect. But why that still, we still see the difference between the flow stress, okay? So there must exist a long thermal effect that is causing this distance. So now the question is, we need to find out the mechanism behind this non thermal effect. So we know plasticity is actually determined by dislocation mobility. And dislocations needs to break away from pinning obstacles to, to move. So there are two ways to increase dislocation mobility. The first one is to exert a force directly on dislocation, which is the so-called called electro wind theory. However, it was then found that the electro wind force is too low to affect uh, plasticity. So the second, second mechanism is to lower the binding energy between dislocations and pinning obstacles. So now the dislocation can move more freely. So let's let's take a look at the, the uh, uh, second uh, possibility. <clears throat> During plastic deformation, dislocations and pinning obstacles will form radical pairs. There are two states for the radical pairs, the ground state and the excited state. The ground state or the air state has high binding energy. The excited state or the T state has a very low binding energy. So it's not easy for dislocation to break away in the S state, but a very easy in the T state. Now the key question is, can pulse current induce the S to T transition? It has been reported that the free energy induced by the magnetic field can indeed induce the S to T transition. So this figure schematically shows the free energy of the S state and the T state. We can see that when the distance of the radical pair is around atomic distance, the energy difference is around 1 EV. And the free energy induced by the magnetic field is too low to uh, transition the S state from the T state. However, as the distance increases, the energy difference is decreases gradually. So that's a window of opportunity that the free energy induced by magnetic field can, in, can induce the S to T transition. To induce the S to T transition, a critical, a, um, 
a critical magnetic intensity is needed. And this again requires a critical current density. So that's why we need a pulse current because pulse current have, has much higher peak current density compared with continuous current when the thermal heating effect is the same. So let's take a look at the fundamental um, physical mechanism of electroplasticity. In the beginning, majority of the medical pairs formed by dislocations and pinning obstacles are in the S state. Then the magnetic field induced by the power current induces the S to T transition. Now we have a high population of the radical pairs in the T state. And in the T state, because of the binding energy between the dislocations and the radical uh, dislocations and pinning of circles are low, so we can we can see a lot of bounding breaks. And that leads to dislocation depending from pinning of circles. That means dislocations can break away from pinning obstacles and they can freely move. With the accumulation of dislocation movement, we can see macroscopic deformation of the sample manifested by uh, manifested by a much lower flow stress, even though the bulk temperature is the same. So to conclude this talk, we have carried out pulse current assisted the uh, a strong pinning of time 64 alloy, and we have observed that that the pulse current can lead to significantly lower flow stress compared with continuous current, especially at a high peak current density. And this means that pulse current can significantly improve the uh, plasticity of time 64. And because of this, we see a significant improvement in the efficacy of electronic pinning as manifested by much deeper layer of gray refinement and plastic deformation. And also we have observed significant in, uh, increase of the magnitude and depth of the compressive resistance stresses generated by electronic pinning. So all these are beneficial for component fatigue performance. So it is expected that um, uh, pulse current assisted electronic pinning will significantly improve the um, fatigue performance of tire 64 alloy. We're still working on this. We hope that uh, we uh, will be able to share the latest results uh, with, uh, with you very soon. So this concludes my talk. So I, want, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Professor uh, Kulubayev for organizing this conference and for giving me this opportunity uh, to give this presentation. I also want to thank my uh, uh, colleagues at Tsinghua, the University of Akron, and Northwestern Polytechnic University for help with um, uh, this um, uh, research work. And I also finally want to thank my graduate students at the University of Akron and uh, Hwazong University of Science and Technology. Thank you. Bye.